now. Okay. Um, the second point is that I'd like to introduce myself. Um, uh, my name is uh, Babatunde Anifooshe, and I am based at the School of Energy, Construction, and Environment uh, within the Faculty of Engineering, Environment, and uh, Computing. Um, uh, my background is actually in, um, you know, uh, the sustainability of uh, crude oil and natural gas resources. Uh, basically, how we can uh, uh, produce oil and gas with very minimal uh, impact on the key environmental receptors. Um, basically, we know that there is renewable energy as well. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, if you look at the facts before us, um, not every aspect of the global economy can be decarbonized at the same rate, uh, which is to say, um, there are certain things that we do on a daily basis that renewable energy cannot, as of this moment, replace. So the question is, how do we keep producing oil and gas with very minimal impact on our immediate environment so that we can be able to sustain ourselves and the generations yet unborn? So I've got a couple of experience in, in, in dealing with both corporate and, and national governments on issues like this. Now, without further ado, um, can, can I thank you all for joining this global webinar series this morning? And um, can everyone let me know what country and partner they are joining us from, okay? Please type your answers into the uh, chat box, okay? So I shall start my presentation now uh, for the next 40, 45 minutes and I will be happy to take questions afterward, okay? And uh, I understand that the, that the, the, the presentation slides uh, will be sent to everyone with a link to this video uh, and, a, and a feedback form, okay? I will be grateful if you can please complete this um, when you have a chance, as this will help us influence uh, future webinars uh, that, the university, that the university offers, okay? So I shall proceed to share my screen with you at this moment. Can everyone see my screen? Hello, can you all see my screen? Okay, so energy and sustainability is clean energy and oxymoron, okay? For today, I, I've got a couple of uh, key themes uh, to discuss with you. First is uh, an introduction to what energy is, okay? And then we'll look at sustainable development and sustainability. Then we'll look at the four key pressure points, the clean energy alternatives, and we'll try to draw some conclusions based on our discussion uh, on, on those issues. Uh, what is energy? So what I've done is to bring you a layman's definition of what energy is, okay? which is basically, as you can see on the screen, uh, the strength and vitality uh, required to sustain physical or mental activity. Okay, uh, the one that is more like it that is relevant to what we're discussing today is in item two, which is the power derived from the utilization of physical or chemical resources to provide light and eat or to work machines. Okay, that is what energy is, and in every facet of our life. One way or the other, we do require energy to actually sustain ourselves and to survive. If I can ask you this question, who amongst all of us listening to this presentation in the last 24 hours haven't had hot meal or used hot water or watched television or used electricity? Is there anyone amongst you uh, 
thus far this morning, in the last 24 hours, that hasn't used energy in one form or the other, chat with me in the box and, and let's see. Uh, this basically tells us the importance of the subject matter that we're just discussing this morning. Uh, my guess is there is none of you, there is none of you uh, on this uh, uh, live chat that hasn't used energy in one form or the other, whether to eat your own or to cook or to, 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 to provide lighting uh, uh, or to even drive a car or to you know, enter a car or, 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 or a bus or, or, or a train, uh, as the case may be. So it's a very, very vital uh, topic of discussion. So, but I, I like to drill down a bit more into what energy is. So there are, we have what is known as primary and secondary energy. So what is primary energy? Uh, these are types of energy that are embodied in nature. Oftentimes it takes the extra effort of humans to actually get them out of their deposits. So things like coal, crude oil, and natural gas, okay? Secondary energy also, also comes from human-induced transformation of primary energy. So for example, um, if you look at wood, for example, as a biomass, um, the, the, the chemical energy in wood can be transformed to, uh, to thermal energy by burning the wood, okay? That is a form of transformation, okay? And the same way you can take coal, crude oil or natural gas and use that to generate electricity. Once you use those primary sources of energy, uh, energy to generate electricity in this example, it then becomes secondary energy. Um, I also like to add that as part of primary energy, you have your renewable energy sources, okay? They are also components of primary energy. So, because it is any source of energy that is natural, that is in nature. So, renewables such as sunlight, wind, uh, thermal, and what have you. So, these are all primary sources of energy. Papa Tunde, we aren't able to see your screen. We can't see the presentation. Really? I did ask. This is why. <laughs> okay, so. Let me, okay, so, Can you see it now? Yes, now we can see it. Now you can see it. Yes. Okay, for that. Okay. Okay, so that, that's, sh should I start from the beginning again or should I just continue? I think you can just continue. I think everybody understood until that point. Thank you. Okay, that's all right. Thank you. So, Putting the primary and secondary energy sources into perspective in our you know, everyday life, uh, what you see here on the screen is the global energy system as of the year 2010. So the volume that is being uh, displayed on the screen is in a million tons of oil equivalent. Uh, so these are the primary energy sources, coal, natural gas, oil, nuclear and renewables, okay? So you then need to go through a certain process of transformation. Okay, so for example, all the fossil fuels or renewables to then generate electricity and heat okay, as secondary sources. And you can see in terms of the number, as of 2010, oil is uh, in 3,821 million tons of oil equivalent. Okay, and then when you then transform that together with natural gas and coal, you get 1,460 going to the industry, uh, which is where you produce and manufacture things like cement, cement, iron, and cars, and what have you. And then you, in terms of transport, this is actually what you use for mobility, 2,294, and some to buildings, and some to other sectors of, uh, of the economy. And, and of course, there are some losses uh, that you get through the, the conversion process. 
And this chart explains in real life the volumes that goes into the four key sectors, uh, which is industry, transport, buildings, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the economy as it were. Okay, so this is, this is what we use uh, 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 in terms of, at least as of 20, 2010, but these things are about to change as the renewable energy sources uh, begin to you know, follow suit. Just to put this in perspective, what, what you have on the screen here is the global primary energy consumption uh, in terawatts per year from 1800 to 2018. What you can see atop here is uh, crude oil, okay, in terms of the volume that is consumed is still at the top, at least up to until about 2017, 2018. And next to that is coal, okay, and natural gas. So, I mean, there are a couple of forces, a couple of factors that are driving this. Um, one is the drive or the need for developing countries to actually em 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 emancipate themselves from poverty uh, to uh, uh, becoming well-developed nations. And secondly, the population growth rate that uh, is projected that the world population currently, which is about 7 billion, is going to rise up to about 9 billion by 2050. Whether you like it or not, this rise in population will trigger the continuous demand for, you know, uh, cheap, and affordable energy uh, sources. Okay. So, in this context, what do we then mean by sustainable development or sustainability? Okay. Sustainable development uh, or sustainability uh, are things that have to do with dealing with environmental problems, poverty, climate inequality, prosperity justice and affordable energy all these key things okay are what may debar the, the the entire world from reaching the goal of sustainable development uh, which is uh, uh, encapsulated in the 17 sustainable development goals of the united nations but sustainable development is defined as a development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Of course, there are many factors that makes this definition almost impossible as we, as, as we speak today. And those are the things that I've just uh, read out to us uh, 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 on, the, on, on the first bullet point. And these, the, the, the ability of being sustainable is what is known as sustainability. And of course, we've got these factors to deal with so that the entire world can remain uh, sustainable. It's a very, it's a very, very um, complex uh, uh, phenomenon. So there are three key aspects of sustainability. You have the environmental, you have the economic, and of course, you have the, the social. So in terms of the environmental, you have natural resource use, and you have the economic, which talks about things like profits, cost savings, economic growth, and research and development. And you have the social, talk about the standard of living, uh, community engagement, education, and equal opportunity. And each of these, there is an intersection between environmental and economic. And that is with the environmental economic facet, which is things like energy efficiencies, subsidies, incentives for natural resource use. And there's an intersection between social and economic uh, variables, uh, which is the economic social uh, interface which talks about business ethics uh, fair trade and workers rights you also have the intersection between social and environmental uh, which talks about environmental justice natural resource accountability and um, in terms of locally and internationally now you need a sync between each of these three elements for us to actually have sustainability as it were okay and as you can see here, uh, these three key principles of sustainability will have to meet at some point for there to be sustainability. But this is a very tough challenge. It's a difficult thing to achieve. So have these three uh, coming together as positives, they, they can also be seen as a natural capital. Each of it has to be in the positive 
for us to have sustainability. So to make this happen, we require new and emerging engineering technology innovations and plus improve business performance through existing procedures. And this is what we require to actually be able to achieve the goal of our sustainability. Okay. Now, as I explained the uh, key, you know, uh, uh, issues around sustainable development and sustainability, those three key, uh, key uh, principles. The question you want to really ask is that, is energy truly sustainable in the context of being able to meet our needs today and then not jeopardizing the ability of future generation to meet their own needs? Can we continuously meet our energy needs without environmental pollution? Can economic, environmental, and social principles come together and meet at that juncture where it allows for true sustainability? I will leave you to ponder on this question until we get to the end of this presentation. And I'll leave people to make up their minds on whether this question is answerable or not. So I've got a few issues to look at. Of course, back in uh, 2015, we had this uh, uh, headline news from Bloomberg that says fossil fuels just lost the race against renewables. Okay? Well, depending on how you see it, if you look at the graph that I am showing on the screen right now, it is the world population graph and energy demand growth. So as the world population increases, there's increase in energy consumption. Uh, on this y-axis is energy consumption in a quadrillion BTU, which is British thermal unit per, per year. Just to put things in context, in perspective, okay? One QBU, so what one Q, uh, quadrillion uh, uh, billion British thermal unit will give you 45 million tons of coal, 1 trillion cubic feet of gas, and 170 million barrels of crude oil. So every quadrillion British thermal units of energy that is consumed per year translates to 45 million tons of coal, 1 trillion cubic feet of gas, and 170 million barrels of crude oil. Okay? That's what that means. Now, only 50% only of the global energy is consumed by 20% of the world. And when I talk about 20% of the world, this refers to the Western world, the developed nations, okay? Only 20% only of the world consumes 50% of global energy that is available. Let us sink in to, 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 to try and, uh, you know, tell you the gravity of the problem at hand. Now, the question then is, how do we ensure that we deliver 80% of the energy needs to, to the world population with less pollution? Okay? How do we ensure that the 80% of the world that is remaining receive or get energy that is uh, produced with less pollution? It, it's a tough challenge. Despite this fact, um, the, the, the CO2 per capita is doubled is double the global average in most of the high income countries, which is the, the Western world. So this means that if you divide uh, the, the population by the amount of uh, CO2 that is produced in the developed world, the CO2, which is the CO2 per capita, that is, is double, is more than the uh, global average of CO2 per capita, okay? So that tells us that there are four pressure points that affects our ability to decarbonize the global economy. So the table that you can see on the screen here uh, shows us the energy demand per capita in high income, fast growing economies and the developing world. Okay? Uh, for high income countries, it ranges between 150 to 300 gigajoules per person per year to fast growing economies 100 gigajoules per person per year. And in developing economies, only 20 to 50 gigajoules per person per year. That is how much energy that people around the world use 
based on the level of development. So in high income countries, people, because you can afford to use electricity, you can afford to eat your homes, you can afford to drive cars, you can afford most of the things that make life comfortable. That is why the amount of energy used per person is this high, 150 to 300 gigajoules. Compared to developing nations where most people tend to struggle to meet daily needs. So that's why the amount of energy used per head per year is as low as 20 to 50 gigajoules. So the four pressure points that dictate how much energy is used around the world are as follows, power generation, transport, industry, and buildings. So we'll look at each of these uh, 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 briefly. So let's look at power generation. Only 20% of global energy is produced through power. So all the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the power that you need to power your homes, uh, to, to, to run the industry and what have you, only 20% of this is actually produced uh, uh, through uh, power. So it, what this means is that if you, if, you, if you are able to use wind and solar together at the same time, okay, if they are at their optimum use, only 20% of global energy demand will be, will, will, be, will be addressed. So this tells us in terms of uh, the capacity of renewable, in, in this example, wind and solar, to actually meet the entire world's energy need. Okay? It can only address 20%. And if you have solar and wind, that will only translate to saving about 13 gigatons of CO2 uh, 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 in terms of the cumulative estimate of 504 gigatons from 1870 to 2014. So the cumulative amount of CO2 that is generated over these years uh, as of uh, 2014 from 1870 is around 545 gigatons. So if we turn the entire power generation effort in the whole world to wind and solar, that will address only 20%, which is a saving of 13 gigatons of CO2. That's a lot, but that's not quite enough to reach the, uh, you know, below two degrees Celsius annual emissions, uh, annual rise in, in, in temperature globally. If you look at buildings as well, buildings, uh, the only problem with buildings is the intermittency of renewables. So this will hinder our ability to efficiently trans transform the building sector, housing sector, uh, in terms of reducing the amount of carbon that is, that is uh, generated uh, within uh, the use of those buildings. So it's easier to design buildings that consume less fossil fuel, unlike other sectors of the global economy. Let's look at industry. Industry is more difficult to, uh, to decarbonize. Uh, and this is because, uh, the because of the use of heavy machineries okay, uh, and high energy needs. Okay? I'll give you an example. As of two years ago, and in fact, as of now, as of this present moment, the energy intensity that is required to produce cement, iron ore, or smelting uh, steel cannot be replaced by renewable power because you need quite a high intensity of energy to produce cement and to, to, to run the machinery that produce cement or iron ore. So no amount of solar or wind can replace this energy need. Let's look at transport. Um, I mean, there's a lot going for transport uh, and a lot of progress has been made in terms of the use of electric vehicles, particularly in passenger uh, transport. The place, uh, the, the sectors of uh, transport that will face some difficulty in, in decarbonizing them are heavy duty uh, vehicles, freight, shipping, and aeroplanes, okay? Uh, because these ones, they're quite huge machinery, if you like, uh, such that it's currently difficult to actually replace this 100% uh, with renewable energy sources. Now, let's look at the Human Development Index uh, in terms of energy demand, how energy demands support better life. What, what you have here is the uh, amount of energy consumed, so gigajoule per capita, just like I showed you 
the differences between the developed and the, uh, the de developing countries, ranging from uh, 150 to 300 for developed and for developing country from 20 to 50. As you can see, the, what has been plotted here, uh, the energy consumption capacity against the human development index on the y-axis. And you can see that the countries that are uh, advanced in their economies, such as United Kingdom, Germ Germany, France, South Korea, Singapore, USA, Canada, Saudi Arabia, are uh, at the top right-hand corner, while many of the developing countries are, are on the lower or middle uh, 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 left-hand corner. Okay, that's just to put the discussion in, in, in perspective. So basically, uh, what, what you have here is 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 a a, a a a diagram showing you how easy it is to actually reduce carbon emissions from industry, built environment, transport sector, and power generation. And this uh, color coding uh, tells you uh, uh, the summary. So the renewable energy sources, as of now, isn't efficient to replace high energy demand for cement making and iron smelting. But by 2040, we, 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 it is suggested that passenger car uh, consumption of liquid uh, uh, would we, 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 we decline, despite having almost double the number of cars globally. You may think, why, why, why would this be so? First of all, um, there will be more electric vehicles uh, used uh, going forward by 2040. So that increases the number of passenger cars, but because more uh, um, electricity-based cars are used, it means that less consumption of liquid in that sector. Is, is likely to be witnessed, okay? So that's a plus there. Uh, it's projected that by 2040, about 170 million electric vehicles will be in use, which is roughly about 10% of the global fleet. But of course, as you can imagine, most of these electric vehicles will be found mostly in developed nations for reasons of affordability uh, and reasons of, uh, you know, level of de development, uh, you know, so for example, for you to be able to use electric cars, you must have charging po points where people can go and charge their vehicles without having to pay uh, much money. Uh, I mean, in, in, in the UK, for example, there are certain places you can go, you'll be able to plug your, your car and charge it for one or two hours. Uh, and, and, and such infrastructure will have to be replicated all over the world for people to be able to use electric cars. And that's why, most of the uh, development in electric vehicle uh, usage by 2040 uh, will be uh, likely to be witnessed in the developed nations. Okay, As I said population explosion is expected to uh, to to be witnessed in most of the uh, developing countries, and of course, to be able to feed and cater for this rising population, you need energy, not just energy, affordable and accessible energy. So. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, it's been projected that for the difference of sectors of the transport industry, the amount of daily consumption of liquid oil uh, will, 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 will rise, uh, you know, uh, by some margin. So as of 2015, amount of energy that the world uses for industry, for transport, for buildings and what have you, for power generation, uh, was roughly about 90 million barrels a day on a daily basis. The world consumed in 2015 are uh, roughly 90 million barrels, and that's uh, roughly what it is still being consumed uh, as of today. 90 million barrels per day of oil uh, uh, consumption. But it's been projected that because of the factors I've highlighted earlier, um, about 104 million barrels per day uh, is what will be expected. Uh, to be our daily consumption by 2040. It's only a projection, uh, but we, we, we'll, we'll need to tell how this uh, pan out. So uh, the, the key question is, how do you ensure that 80% of the world population uh, get uh, the required level of energy just as the, uh, just as the uh, other part of the world, the developed uh, world, which constitutes 20%? So that's the key question. So let me just give you a, a little bit more statistics here. Yeah? As of 2010, roughly 1.1 billion people were without access to electric, electricity. Okay, 
uh, throughout the world. And mostly these are people within the developing nation. But according to the Energy Progress Report of 2020, uh, this 1.1 billion people has actually dropped to 789 million as of 2018. This is good progress. And hopefully things will continue to, uh, to, to, to move in the right direction. Of, of course, people have projected that COVID-19 and other things may affect this going forward. In addition to that, there are about 1 billion people uh, with intermittent access to electricity. What does that mean? I mean, many of you live in places where uh, the, the electricity supply uh, goes off uh, from time to time. So that's what we mean by intermittent access to electricity. So you can have electricity for two hours in the day, and for the rest of the day, you are in darkness. Uh, I've been in this country for about 15 years. I can count on my fingers like this, how many times the electricity in this country uh, has actually gone off. Uh, just a few, maybe once or twice. And that could be as a result of fault from the power substation. And as of today, only about 1% of the global energy comes from solar and wind. Although this is projected to rise uh, by, uh, to up to 40% by uh, 2100. So that's a long time ago. That's a long time to come, rather. I mean, if you take, do the math from, this is 2020 to, to 2100, that's 80 years time. That is the projection that by, by that time, you have just 40% of the world's energy being supplied by uh, solar and wind. So what, what this points out is that there's a, there's a future here where you have oil, gas, and renewable energy uh, that co coexisting uh, uh, as a potential way, way, way forward. Okay. I mean, what I, what I have here, uh, I mean, for the rest of the, the class uh, of this uh, presentation is to try and look at the so-called clean alternatives, okay, which are very useful. Uh, what you see here is energy generation by the R from 2 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, 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 on a daily, on a typical uh, day. Okay, I like to you know buttress this by uh, you know really learn some facts here. Uh, uh, be, during the uh, Obama administration in the U.S., about 150 billion U.S. dollars was invested to make solar and wind energy accessible to. To all, and also to subsidize, to subsidize uh, uh, the, the the electric car ownership in, in, in the U.S. Now, the key question is: How sustainable is this? How many countries around the world can afford to subsidize uh, electric cars, wind, and solar energy that much? Okay, one fifty billion dollars, you know, over a, a ten-year period. As you can see on the screen, uh, solar and wind are generated about 10 to 30 percent of the time, okay, on a daily basis. So, uh, roughly about 10, 12, 10 to 12 a.m. Uh, p.m. rather, to about 4 to 5 p.m. on a daily basis. So, what then tends to happen is you have excess energy, excess renewable energy being generated during these peak hours. Um, and as you can see, this is wind in yellow, okay? This, this dark yellow, and light yellow is solar, okay? And what you can see here is the excess energy that is, that is generated. And this is as a result of the fact that the battery storage is still an ongoing research. Uh, there's yet to be a, 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 breakthrough, a breakthrough on a large scale in, in our ability to actually store excess energy. Is one of the fundamental problems with renewables. Of course, renewables are much cleaner and much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, useful in the in, in the sense of sustainability compared to to, to to fossil fuels. Okay. So the question is, do non-fossil fuel sources generate pollutants? Okay. Uh, now the the chart that I'm showing on the screen is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, okay? They, they, they take back to 2014. As you can see, you have solar farm, geothermal, hydropower, and nuclear. And on the y-axis here, you can see the emissions uh, and CO2 equivalent per kilowatt, okay? So see the emissions that you get from solar, okay? From solar farm, 
uh, that's 40, 48 uh, uh, grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt. And geothermal 38, hydro power 24, and nuclear uh, 12. Okay, so fossil, non fossil fuels, i.e., the, the, the clean, the so called clean energy alternatives, aren't as clean as, as what people may think, actually. I, I'll show you this as well in terms of an investment paradox. Uh, I'll show you this German example. Okay, these are the different sources of energy. Okay, as of 2016. And uh, showing the percentage of uh, uh, the commitment or investment in German electricity from coal, nuclear, and natural gas, wind, and solar. So the German government installed 4% more solar panels in 2016, but unfortunately, they generated 3% less electricity from solar. Also, they, in, they, they installed 11% more wind turbines in 2016, but ended up generating 2% less electricity from wind. Now, you may be wondering, why is this so? It's a case of the more you see, the less you, you know. What is happening here is that we as humans have control of our investment. We have control of ideas. We have control of how much money we can invest in a particular energy source but we don't have control on how much sunlight comes on daily. We don't have control of how much we can transport this sunlight that is generated at a particular location to other areas without losing energy in the process of transmission. We don't have control on how much wind can blow and when it blows. These are things that, be, that are beyond nature. And that explains why the more in this example again i'm not saying this is the case everywhere but i'm just using this example to show you some of the challenges with converting renewable energy to 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 secondary energy such as you know electricity for use in this example now if germany had 50 percent more solar capacity by 2030 okay this is what you get okay so um in 2016 you had 40.3 gigawatt of electricity generated. If they added 50% more solar capacity by 2030, that will rise by 60 gigawatt. However, if you had a year like year 2016, where wind and solar didn't quite behave as expected, those investments will only yield 9% of uh, electricity okay? investment in, in solar and wind will yield only 9% uh, uh, of uh, uh, electricity in 2030. Okay, if you have a year like 2016, where solar and wind, I think behave quite as, as expected. Now, what then is the solution? Okay, uh, one would think that it's easy to actually put this excess energy into a battery storage as an option. Uh, I take an example from California, as said by uh, uh, Michael Schellenberger in a tech talk, in a tech talk present, presentation. California is a big city, is a big state in the United States, okay, um, and it has only 23 minutes of electricity storage, and that 23 minutes of electricity storage is assuming that you use every car, every stop, every truck in the state, along with existing storage. That's how bad uh, uh, deficit we have in terms of our ability to uh, develop the infrastructure to store excess uh, 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 energy from renewables. I'll show. I also like to show you some paradox here in terms of the German uh, electricity prices. How uh, it rose to about 47 percent from 2006 2016. Okay? Despite all the things that Germany, as a world capital of renewable, uh, as, as it were all the investment, you can see the rise in prices of electricity. This is basically because producing electricity from renewables isn't cheap. So the cost has to be passed down to the consumers. Yet, the German electricity is two times more expensive than the French electricity, as you can see here. Okay, uh, Average price per household, uh, which is uh, cost uh, in cents per, kilo, uh, per kilowatt hour. In Germany, it's about 30. In France, it's 16. But in France, 
they generate two times more electricity from clean energy sources than Germany. Okay? So this is France and that's Germany. Uh, what you have in green is the clean energy, which is 93% in France. The dirty, the, the dirty energy is 54% uh, in Germany. Yeah, France generates two times more electricity from clean energy sources than Germany. And, you know, this, this, do, this doesn't add up, does it, in terms of the numbers? So I bear in mind that the, 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 the clean energy is mainly from hydro and, and, and nuclear power. It, that may explain why you have those disparity in the numbers. Yet, the emissions have been rising uh, since 2009 okay, uh, to 2016 in, in Germany. Okay, as you can see, uh, the rise, the, the steep rise in emission. Okay? And this is as a result of the fact that uh, the closure of nuclear uh, power plants in Germany has wiped out emissions reductions from the less coal power sources. Uh, uh, as you can see here, this is not, uh, natural gas uh, and, and, and coal and nuclear and, 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 and those other sources in terms of uh, what's uh, the level of reductions and uh, of in, in emissions from those sources. What this graph shows is that when you have excess renewable energy uh, uh, generated, there tends to be drop in the value of those energy, irrespective of the amount of investment that is put into it. So when you have excess wind power, for example, there's a 40% drop in value. Okay? That's roughly about uh, minus 1%. one percent. Okay? Uh, in solar, you have about 50% drop in value. When you produce excess uh, uh, solar and there is no way of using either using it at the time it's produced or, or, or storing it. The value of that energy produced, solar energy produced, is dropped by 50%. Okay? This takes into account all the investment, all the money is put into the technology and the infrastructure to build those solar panels or wind turbines, as the case may be. So this is a huge problem. But the hope is that as we proceed uh, forward, there will be solutions uh, to, to, to these uh, titan problems. Now, in terms of the material throughput by type of energy source, okay, each of these uh, renewable energy sources, solar, hydro, wind, geothermal, and nuclear, okay, they are not all pollution free. Okay? So we need to try and be a bit more critical and balance the argument between fossil fuel and renewable energy sources. Okay? Uh, this data is from the DOE, Department of Energy, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, okay? Uh, and, and it's quote Mary and uh, Albert 2015, uh, nuclear energy, an introduction to the concepts, systems, and applications of nuclear, uh, as uh, published by Elsevier uh, in 2015. You can see the mass of materials in tons uh, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, tons of uh, throughput that is used, okay, uh, for each of these, so cement, concrete, glass, fuel, steel, and others, okay, this, this is what is used uh, in, in producing or in making sure we can use solar, hydro, wind, geothermal, as the case may be, and I do, like I just mentioned earlier, how do you produce cement? You can't produce cement without burning those high carbon intensive uh, uh, fossil fuel sources like crude or natural gas and coal. Same as concrete, glass, fuel, and, and steel. Okay, so you, we can't actually use renewables without fossil, if you like. I hope, I hope this is all making sense to us. Uh, and I'll be more than happy to answer questions uh, shortly. Now, this, this screen again shows us, uh, you know, uh, a typical example, solar panels, okay? For example, they produce approximately 300 times more waste than nuclear, than nuclear reactors when providing the same amount of energy. Of course, nuclear has less uh, issues with pollution, but the, one of the major problems with nuclear, as you, as you know, is the potential for disaster. Uh, look at the Fukushima disaster. Uh, a few years ago, and Chernobyl as well. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why why Germany, for example, 
uh, uh, began to close down most of its uh, nuclear power plant. And that's why you saw the spike in the amount of uh, you know, uh, 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 emissions from, from other sources that had to you know, uh, you know, uh, augment uh, what nuclear was, was able to produce. Uh, I've put this slide to also, also show you some of the key challenges in, in, in our, uh, investment in renewables. It's not cheap. Okay? Uh, so in, that was back in December 2017, the UK government had to actually abandon the idea for a 1.3 billion pound tidal power lagoon in, in Swansea. Okay? It was a good idea. Uh, they wanted to generate electricity energy from tidal power in the in the UK but having looked at the investment required the commitment is quite a huge amount of money uh, I mean if you throw half of these into the regular sources of energy you generate more energy and then although of course there's going to be more pollution from from that but these things are not cheap and this is one of the key reasons why you know, uh, governments around the world are, are you know, being, they, 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 I, I, how do I say this? They, 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 they are being, they are being careful how to the, the proceed with certain types of investment in renewables. It's, it's, it's still more useful to, to invest in things like solar and wind uh, as you'll be able to generate a bit more compared to one point, compared to tidal power lagoon in, 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 the, in this example. Final thoughts, okay. Um, the conversion of primary energy, which I explained earlier, so coal, gas, and crude oil and renewable energy sources, their conversion to work for human needs is enabled by machineries. And these machineries are created from natural resources, time from the earth. These machineries need continuous operation and maintenance. And these machineries have finite life span. This means that you need to continue to produce, you need to continue to extract resources to produce and maintain those machineries from the earth's resources. Okay. So the examples that I've given in one and two are ap applicable to both fossil fuel generation and renewable energy generation. You, you have an oil rig or you have a turbine, a, a turbine platform offshore or a wind farm, as, as, as it were. The materials that you use to build those facilities, whether it's fossil or renewables, require machinery. And those machineries are produced uh, uh, from, from natural resource materials taken from the earth's uh, uh, crops. This take us, I don't know many of you, I don't know how many of us are familiar with the second law of thermodynamics. It suggests that converting primary energy, i.e. fossil or renewable, to secondary energy, like heat or electricity, will increase entropy. What is entropy is basically disorder, okay? It will increase the level of disorder on the earth as a closed system, okay? Therefore, the conversion and use of fossil or renewable energy will continue to cause environmental degradation. So my take on this is that the devil you know is better than the angel that you haven't met. Not much as we speak today, not much is said about the commissioning of renewable energy infrastructure, yet they mostly contain heavy metals that cause uh, impact on uh, em environmental uh, re receptors. I'll give you an example. When you take an average solar panel, okay, a uh, solar panel con contains heavy metals like a lead, chromium, cadmium, uh, nitrogen trifluoride, and sulfur hexafluoride. Exafluoride, and these are uh, potential ca carcinogens to human health. But no one is talking about that as we speak, because everyone is engrossed in trying to stop the use of fossil fuel 
and, and uh, which is understandable because of our climate, because of our future, because of our uh, existence. To conclude, the analogies that have been pro uh, provided above in terms of the clean and renewable energy or renewable energy sources, it shows clearly that these sources cannot exist without the continuous extraction of natural resources. So I think the target should shift away from wanting or attempting to store fossil fuel 100% at a goal, okay? So don't get me wrong, at some point in the future, maybe 50, uh, 80 years down the line, there will be a reduction in the amount of fossil fuel consumed drastically because technologies in renewables will have grown much uh, 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 deeper than it is currently to make those renewable energy sources much more uh, accessible and cheaper for people, not only in the West, but all over the world. But the attention should be on the consumption, the rate of consumption of energy because this is what will determine how sustainable the human race is. So the higher the amount of energy that we use, the less sustainable the human race will be, okay? Whether it's renewable, whether it's a, a, a fossil fuel. So for policy efforts must continue to target reduction in energy consumption by humans. So not necessarily wanting to switch 100% from fossil to clean energy. As we speak, as of today, and in the near, in the short term, this may be a difficult thing to achieve, i.e. switching 100% from fossil to, uh, to clean energy. So what will likely happen is a scenario where both fossil fuel and clean energy sources coexist hand in hand and support one another. We will ensure to uh, continue to minimize impact from fossil fuel consumption and production, as well as clean energy production and consumption. The question is to you all, is clean energy an oxymoron? Your guess is as good as mine. Thank you for listening. I am now happy to take questions. Over to you, Sally. Thank you very much for, for that, Bobbiton Day. It was very interesting. I'm sure everyone um, will agree. If anybody's got any questions, we'll give you a few minutes to type this into the chat box. Um, if, you, if you do have any, if you can do that now, please. I can see that we've had one question come in from uh, Raven. Raven, okay. Electrolysis of water is a good idea, and and I think it's the way to go into the in, into the future. Uh, I I I I I buy into the idea of 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 of, of doing that. Did I answer your question, uh, Raven? Or do I need to type the answer? No, not at all. I think if if we can just communicate like this, I'm sure. Okay, that's that fine. Great. We'll give everybody another couple of minutes to ask a few more questions. The uh, video will be shared with everybody uh, via email today or tomorrow, as Babatunde mentioned at the beginning. Okay.
I think if we have if no further questions, um, just thank you again, Babbitt and Dave, for a very interesting. Oh, sorry, we have had a question from yeah, Megan. There are other questions coming in. Uh, with the circular economy movement, it is aimed at reducing the consumption of resources, but in, develop, in redeveloping these resources due to use, due to you, you, you see an added body in it. Yes, that's correct. Um, Megan Rubulet, yes, the circular economy in, in trying to re, re, redevelop or reuse resources, uh, it's an additional body. In. I mean, it takes me back to the uh, second law of uh, thermodynamics that I mentioned. The more you do uh, this, the more you use these resources or reuse those resources, uh, you tend to create entropy. Entropy is uh, refers to as uh, um, uh, disorder uh, in, in the world system. Okay, Electric car production needs factories that depend on electricity that couldn't be replaced by renewable energy. Uh, well, that's not the that's not what I said. Um, electric car production needs factories. Yes, that depends on electricity that couldn't be replaced. No, it can be replaced by electricity by renewable energies. It can. Uh, in fact, in in car in trans in the transport the transport sector is one of the, the the sectors that is more amenable to decarbonization than others. Okay, it's just that there are certain aspects that cannot be hundred percent replaced by uh you know those renewable energy sources okay uh sammy i hope i answered those that question I think yes that i think cool. that was that was wonderful thank you um thank you again for your time um, and as i said everybody will receive a copy of this video um probably within the next 24 hours and thank you everyone for joining our uh bi-weekly webinar and i hope you found it um as informative as i did thank you very much Okay, then. Thank you. Bye, everyone.